being recorded. All righty. Okay. So I'm looking at attendees and I see there's one and not, not our Lauren. Yeah. Okay. There's another one. Oh, good, Nancy Schroeder's, but that's okay. It's frustrating not to have all that stuff. Yeah, I bet the screen looks very different to you. Yeah, yeah. I was trying on my old computer, Mark's on the new laptop. Oh. I said, just give me my iPad, <laughs> and that worked. Good for you for a backup. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. We know you're on vacation, so uh, we appreciate it. Oh, quite welcome. <laughs> okay, so should I start? Might as well. Okay, welcome to the July 14th Board of Health meeting. And pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to ac access the meeting may do so. Um, there is an online Zoom link at the bottom of the agenda found on the Amherst Board of Health website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio recording of this meeting as soon as possible. And all Board of Health minutes can be accessed on the Board of Health website. So first we'll have a roll call. And Maureen? Present. Tim? Here. Nancy? Here. Lauren, are you there? I don't see Lauren yet. Yeah. Okay. And we only have four members because Steve's term expired. So we have three of four people, so we have a quorum. And the first item is review the minutes of the May 5th meeting and then the June 9th. So for the May 5th meeting minutes, are there any corrections, additions? I didn't see anything. And if not, may I have a motion to accept them? I'll move to accept the meetings, the minutes of the May 5th meeting. Is that the right date? Yeah. And Jim, I second to, it. Okay, so all in favor? Uh, Maureen? Uh, aye. Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. And now the June 9th minute. It was just you and I there, uh, Maureen. So uh, we can vote on it because yeah, well, we were the only two there, Steve and George, but he's no longer on the... Um, right, Tim was away. Yeah. And Tim was away and Lauren couldn't make it. Um, graduation or something. Mm, yes, nice. yes. So, so I'll move to accept the minutes of the June 14th meeting. Is that the right date? Yes. And I'll <laughs> second it. So I don't have them in front of me. Maureen. <laughs> well, yes, I. And Nancy, I. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So next on the agenda is public comment on topics that are on the agenda only. And we will have another public comment at the end of the meeting for other topics. So I can't see any of that, Jen. Mm -hmm. um, there are no, no hands raised. Yeah. Okay. So there's no public comment right now. Okay. And all business, um, should we wait to see if 
Oh, here's Lauren. Oh, Lauren. Lauren's here. Okay, so I'm promoting her. Let's see. Oh, good. Just in time. Yay. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. She's getting settled in there. Lauren, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Well, maybe there you are. Something's happening. Something's can you hear us, Lauren? There's some motion. I think we're getting close. Oh, yay. Hi, Lauren. We can't hear you. Lauren? Okay. Any ideas? Her video is off. She must be adjusting. Her electronics, her video and audio. <clears throat> okay. We can see you, we can't hear you. Yeah. No. So, sadly. Yeah. Hmm. Would calling in be another option or? Don't know what the best thing is. Maybe Lauren can use the phone for audio. Can still be in the Zoom. Can she hear us? Know. You don't know. Okay. Lauren, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can she vote with thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, she's hearing us. Lauren, is it is your computer on mute? <clears throat> it looks like it's on mute. Something's on mute. Yeah, it is on mute. Can you unmute yourself, Lauren? Find mute and unmute. Yeah. Okay. Got you. So Lauren, can you still not hearing? Yeah. Maybe the phone. Yeah. So Lauren, can you call in? No. No. She doesn't have the earbuds, I think it sounds like, it looks like. Is it possible to enable the chat box? Is there a chat box function here? At least no, I mean, that's a good good question. I, I do, I would set that up um, when I'm initiating the, the webinar. So it's not something I can put in place now. Um, that I'm aware of, yeah. Mm. Right. Should we continue, Nancy, or? Yeah, let's continue. Okay. So Tim, thank you. We got the draft of 
the toxic chemical regulations that you and Lauren have been working on. So do you want to give us um, an introduction? It was a pleasure to read them. You made a lot of good sense and I loved how you updated the um, references. So do you want to give us an overview of your work? Yes. Um, so we, I started off with our old toxic regulations, which had which was had minimal um, uh, uh, minimal chemicals considered, and and so what we I did is primarily included some uh, at least found some examples from other towns where they had used, and most of them were based on groundwater contamination. So that was the original draft and uh, and then when it was circulated among Lauren and uh, 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 you know we, we, we added a few contaminants especially one contaminant which is essentially becoming very important is the uh, uh, is the PFAs mm -hmm. um, which per, uh, you know per and polyfluoro uh, alkyl chemicals essentially we, um, they do not break down. They are also detected in almost every media, soil, water, air, even in our food. So that was added. And also um, uh, Lauren brought in the neonicotinoids, which are new class of pesticides, which, which mimic uh, nicotine, um, uh, nicotine uh, chemical composition, but they are, they are neuter, neurotoxin for, for pest control. But it more recently in 2017, I think they started to find some connection on human health. And so, and the other ones are endocrine disruptors, uh, which also are emerging contaminants in the past couple of decades. There are a lot of research on pharmaceuticals, um, um, personal care products, most of them which are primarily not treated, but eventually they can enter into our water drinking water systems. So, um, I primarily defined many of these and also the potential risk involved and the policy is primarily, uh, policy regulation is primarily addressing um, not a full um, uh, control, but it is a try to do the best in terms of managing and mitigating these contaminants at the source level for our uh, our town properties, town buildings, and public schools, um, and, and there are some still um, uh, research on uh, complete, you know, some sort of a uh, regulating uh, to a full level on some of these contaminants. But it's 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 everywhere, you know, and especially PFAs are everywhere. They are already spread out, and so one of the approaches primarily to mitigate. To minimize, alt, you know, by using alternate in alternate uh, chemicals, which will not be this damaging, and that was one of the regulations um, which were listed in this one in the procedures. Um, try to minimize those paper products which are chlorine-free, which is coming from our old regulation, um, and then these PFAs and toxic substances to. Um, have some sort of as much minimal contamination as possible, both at the source level and the transfer level. Um, and, and also uh, some of the cleaning products and degreases um, which, to have some sort of least uh, toxic products, um, uh, which are essentially we're proposing that, you know, the, at the source level, we try to minimize as much as possible in the town properties. And if, if that is not possible, uh, this is uh, economic feasibility. That means it's very expensive or anything. There is a variance class added to that. Uh, primarily, it comes to the variance can be obtained from the health director through our board. Um, and so that is the, in essence, quick summary of the uh, toxic chemicals regulations. Uh, so, 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 um, there were a lot of uh, uh, references which were added, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, this was some of the something suggested, but especially the references related to emerging contaminants were added, but also 
how this type of a impact varies with social classes, ethnicity, age. Um, so that highlights the importance of looking at these uh, toxic chemicals and trying to regulate them. Mm -hmm. Maureen, do you have any comments or questions? Well, I just went, I read through it. I think overall it looks and sounds very good. Um, but I, I guess I had um, a couple of things that I noticed. It, in the second paragraph of section one, there's a sentence that is complicated. It has, it's about halfway through and it says, since existing environmental regulations based on a risk assessment are inadequate to protect human and environmental health adequately, a proactive approach is needed. And it just as clumsy, and I wondered yeah. if it would say something more like, um, since existing environmental regulations based on a risk assessment do not adequately protect human environmental health, a proactive, I don't know, just, it's just wording. It, okay, and it yeah. probably doesn't really change the meaning of anything. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Um, the other question I wonder, you know, one of the is to phase out the use of chlorine bleached paper products where available. But that was from our old regulation. Has that not been done? Or, um, you know, that was my question. Are there still some remaining things maybe where the products aren't av weren't available or they're still waiting for more um, cost effective or, uh, plentiful source of some of these things? That was one of my questions. Um, I had that question and then that goes along with that in section four, it said the town will have one year from approval of this regulation to come into full compliance with this regulation. And that was in the old regulation. And was this done in the past? So I don't know if Jen would know. Yeah, so you, section four, number four. You know, I can tell you. I can I can look into it because I don't okay. have a full answer. Yeah. I, sure I knew you wouldn't because th these regulations are from two thousand and one that Tim is. But, but I do. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do know that there are emails that go out and there are reminders about using recycled products and um, chlorine-free paper. So we do get notifications that's on our radar. Oh, good. Um, so I can verify this with Jeremiah LaPlante, who's head of uh, uh, facilities. Um, I told him that this is a regulation that we're gonna be looking at. And he said he'd like to be involved with it if, if we want him to. So if, if yeah. you want to include him, I thought he would be the go-to person. Yes. So uh, depending on what you find out, maybe um, Maureen and Tim, would it be something like that to um, continue the process of phasing out the use of, of paper products that we've... Yeah, the one thing I, I was sort of reading, it was like, hey, like there's something called processed chlorine free because I think that the chlorine comes into the processing of the paper but doesn't end up in the paper so it's it's like a more a, I just I just happen to read a tiny bit about this and I wondered if that would be a better way of saying what we're after because it's not so much that there's chlorine in the paper but the process of using the chlorine creates these di yeah. these dioxins or something that is toxic um, so the, the, just to clarify, I think the paper products des essentially don't have chlorine. That, that's right. not we are targeting. It's, a, it's indirectly we are targeting the, uh, the industrial process, which right. is actually bad, bad for. And so I think even though it was listed in the previous regulation, uh, we might still have those types of products imported mm -hmm. and used, you know, uh, which mm -hmm. essentially can be any industry. And I think carefully considering um, paper products in terms of the life cycle, that's what I think this we have to emphasize, you know, 
Uh, it it right. probably was not. It, you cannot phase out paper products. No, no. Uh, it's going to be new products coming in, new type of a, and then that last um, uh, point which we are taking one year from approval. That is not just for this chlorine-free products, but it's also for the others, news. new PFAs or other new nicotinoids, and so that's why we had that fourth one. You know, so. Okay. Um. The other thing I found confusing was the last statement in section three um, about the event of a less toxic substance is not replaceable for any reason. It, 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 it doesn't sound right to me. It seems like oh. it's not available for any reason, I guess, or something. Not. It, yes, I agree. Okay. I think that one was a, a typo or a just a. Steve had a correction there, and then I think when I incorporated, I think I didn't carefully check that. One. So it should, it's not um, adoptable or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I, any more, Maureen? Yeah, my last one was all products used in public spaces should have minimum contamination by PFAS and other toxic substances. How do we know what has PFAS in it? <laughs> That's, you know, I guess, I mean, if it's on the label, if there is a per whatever, fluoro, whatever on the label, but contamination with that is a big, is a big part of the problem. I, from, from the little I read when we were talking about mosquitoes, um, some of the um, pesticides used to kill the mosquitoes they showed PFAS in them they weren't they came from the container that the that the um, product was in because the the original um, product didn't have PFAS but once you pour it and put it in the container and let it sit there for a while then it had PFAS so I just I guess I I think that's a good goal but I just I guess I'm maybe that's where someone else comes into the picture about how we how we work on doing that, you know, it's, it just seems like a challenge. Yeah, I think um, when I had that in mind and I think we can, you know, the PFAS is everywhere. It's already in soils, water, food and everything. But one way we could handle in terms of further contamination mm -hmm. is at the source level. Right. And many of the procurements, for example, uh, furniture, um, curtains, mm -hmm. um, having some sort of a techniques for fire control, like a for foam, you know, all those have PFAS. And and I think at the pro procurement level, if if people are aware of trying to avoid those types of and then use some alternate material. That's what right. I mean by that, you know. Yeah, okay. So, so that's that sentence, products containing PFAS should be avoided to the extent feasible. Is that what you're referring to, Tim? Um, On page three? Or, or page four in the procedure part is also a statement to that effect. Procedure uh, section number three, I think. Yeah, yeah section three yeah. of the, um, at the bottom yeah. of my page is yeah. the products. And then I, I had a question on the pesticides. Pesticides shall not be used until, should we put all alternative means of pest control have been tried rather than alternative? Because maybe they'll just do one thing and then say, eh, let's just go for the big guns. Sure. Oh, it looks like, is that Lauren's hand in her phone? Hi. Yeah. Oh, hi. Oh. Yay. Oh, hi, Lauren. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I called in. I don't know if there's an echo. Yeah, I, have, I hear an echo. Sorry. Well, okay. I can talk. <laughs> Uh, one I, way I you, can, to, uh, you can mute your laptop or uh, speaker. Okay. That might help. 
That should be good. How about now? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. It's good. Oh, nice. Good job. I had um added the the neo nicotinoids right for the the pesticide. Sorry about the dog. Um, um, so the the copy that I printed out and the draft that was shared, I don't know if it was added, but I, I really think that important so yeah it's very much it's here, in there. Lauren. it's in here lauren oh it's in there okay okay yes. they added Thank that you. yeah yes and tim, okay. tim acknowledged you in the beginning um for, okay. for doing that work so thank you for that and it's on page two of the the last draft okay So, yeah. So, how do we want to make corrections or follow up? Make corrections or follow up. So, Tim has our few comments. There's not too much. And Jen is going to check on the um, uh, what's been happening in in the town, um, what we have of a record. Um, then we'd have to have a hearing. And, and vote on them. I, I keep I, I hear myself in an echo now. Yeah, there is an echo. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, so can I, uh, I think I will make some edits based on the comments today mm -hmm. and then send it, I will send it to everyone. And I think if, if, if Jennifer can send it to the key players in the town procurement, just for them to review the draft and, and once if we have that one, we can announce a public comment. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, I think yeah. that sounds good. I'll send I'll send it out and ask about you know implementation. Um, I think that would be an important thing. Um, you know, just make sure it's pretty clear that I don't have to be notified for certain variances. You know, just just specific ones like you said. Um, that's sort of a worry of mine that people are, are always asking for variances. So we'll figure that out. This one also uh, not just the procurement. Um, the fire department also need to be involved, you know, especially some of the fire control forms have PFAs, but we need to involve them right in the beginning. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, yeah. Tim and Lauren. Any other comments on that before we move to the next item? Okay, so the community assessment, um, Emily is working on phase two, which is um, a lot of um, objective data. And then she's gonna be starting with some um, interviews of key informants which will then lead to phase three, which is much more of the subjective data collection, um, which would begin in the fall. Uh, we're having a second meeting the end of um, this month on phase one. And a, um, I, I just got an email from another um, a master's student who would like to join the team as part of his um, work for his master's degree. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk to him on Monday and he's sending me his resume uh, over the weekend. So I'll keep you posted on that. 
Any questions for me? Okay, and then uh, a move to gun violence, a public health epidemic. I, I introduced that last month. Um, um, it, the, the board, when I was on the board in 2015, had it on the agenda. And then after I left the board, it was um, dismissed and, and um, not taken up again. But I just looked up the data to date for 2022. Um, there's 10,774 homicides, 12,870 suicides, so that gives us 23,644 people killed just this year by gun violence, 337 in mass shootings, and 15 in murders. Uh, Children up to age 11, 186 were killed and 404 injured. And with teens, oh, my numbers here, or um, 717 were killed and 1,910 uh, teens were injured just this year. Um, and so I brought it up for the board to consider firearm uh, awareness, identifying factors that contribute and protect from gun violence and using the public health model for us to define and monitor the problem in town and in our county, identify risks and protective factors in our town um, develop and test preventive strategies and ensure that there's widespread adoption of effective strategies. Um, so um, I introduced this last month and um, we didn't have everybody there. So I wanted to just bring it up again and ask for people's comments and uh, where they think and how we should proceed with it. So any comments? Do we have statistics for the town? I know those are national statistics, right? Right. Um, I didn't look for those, but that's what we would need for defining and monitoring the problem uh, of finding out what's happening in town. The last time we looked at it, Scott Livingstone was a guest and he gave us a lot of statistics and, and how gun licenses were issued and how many gun licenses there were. So that was very helpful data. So that's what we'd have to mm -hmm. get. I, I think he's the person, is that correct, Jen? Sure, that would be, that would be Chief Livingstone, yeah. And, and also our next guest might have some- Right, <laughs> Earl Miller. <laughs> But I, I wanted to get the sense of other board's members of, do you want to keep this on our agenda? Uh, where would you like to proceed from this? I just brought it up to put on our agenda um, because it, it uh, every time you open up the newspaper or uh, listen to the news on the radio and I listen to NPR, you, you just hear about someone else being killed or injured um which is awful yeah. i guess my you know partly my concern is that the new with the recent supreme court decision which is going to affect the state laws and people may be challenging our state laws as well um is there anything the town can do to support strengthening those laws i think there are ways of approaching it that that might ban uh, weapons in certain places as opposed to certain people. And I'd be curious to know what that process is like and, um, and is there a way we can support that in, in our community. In addition to just 
gun safety education and um, enforcement of the laws that exist. Thank you. Yeah, and that that's exactly it, Maureen. So that we would um, that would be helping define them the the problem and then identifying risk and protective factors, and then what actions can we as a board do um, for prevention and. Now, how should we proceed, Tim? I, I, would, do you, I would just add that there's oh. there's several uh, pieces of legislation moving through the state, uh, through the House of Reps and the Senate. Um, and I think we're all waiting to see, just so folks know, those gun laws are being challenged in court now. We expect, you know, that they will need to shift um, to follow the Supreme Court's guidance. Um, uh, just to, uh, you know, add to, to Nancy's uh, data set, which I think is really important is, you know, one of the real pieces here is around suicide prevention. Um, we are number three in the country uh, for lowest death rate um, by suicide. And that is absolutely, the two states above us are, are Jersey and New York. Um, so you're looking at kind of a real correlation. And, and that's because the longer that it takes for someone to ultimately make that decision, for someone to move forward with an attempt, every second uh, lowers it. Uh, and if you can buy two minutes, you decrease the suicide rate by something like 80%. Wow. Um, so it's, it's you know, I think it's really important there. Uh, I think uh, just time-wise, I think we'll have a lot more clarification um, kind of towards the end of next winter as the courts kind of come back in the session uh, and look at these things. But uh, I think there's a real sense of kind of, uh, waiting to figure out what the, the kind of new direction of the court will say on, on gun laws. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, can I ask to introduce, uh, I don't know who Earl Miller is. Okay. Yes. Sorry, you know. I... Not much. I'm the director of the community <laughs> responders for equity, safety, and service. And uh, so new face, but it's it's glad, it's good to meet you all. Uh, I was very late to the last one, so I'm glad I was here on time today. Thank you. <laughs> and Earl will be under new business, Tim, um, uh, introducing himself in his role. So, uh, gonna... Lauren has a hand. Okay. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if I was yeah, unmuted. I wasn't sure if I was um, I don't really follow the the court, um, what's going on in the legislature closely, but I I am concerned about what I also have heard on NPR about the connection between um, households who have guns and it's it's easier to um, have a a deadly situation. Um, with suicide, if suicide is attempted. So I would like to see us as a board, like if there's um, any kind of initiatives that we could do, like uh, educational wise, or, you know, I don't know how we would approach that on an outreach level, but it's just another issue that needs to be shared and information that needs to be shared. So I think that's how I would like to see the board um, inform the community by just maybe first educating. That would be part of the prevention strategies. Um, should we in the fall have start again and have Scott Livingston um, and possibly Earl um, talk about um, guns, guns and licenses in Amherst and especially Scott, what he sees from um, the police point of view um, and then figure out what other data we need to define um, the, the and monitor the problem. Uh, reaching out to the schools and the university, um, the colleges and the university, uh, do they have protocols in place um, 
it seems as if a lot of these um, mass shootings have been uh, often are related to campuses and and education. Some of them, I know. When I I don't know Tim if you've ever had that feeling, but I know towards the end of my teaching, I thought, oh my God, if as, if a student is really disgruntled with a grade, what might he or she do? Yeah. I'm sure there's active shooter training at those institutions, and that's a scary thing to do, but um, that's really way down the line. I think if right. the, the prevention thing is really what we want to see. Right. So we want to know what's in place already and how uh, those institutions view, uh, define and view the problem, if it is a problem. So. Do you think having Scott come um, to our September, October meeting to talk about guns, guns licenses, how he views guns in town? Um, I think it'll be good, but I think before we um, spend time in this, I think some groundwork, I think it's a very important problem, but I would like to know a couple of things. One is, um, some evidence of that that is a real problem for Amherst. First thing. Second thing is uh, what the Board of Health can do beyond the current um, structure which law enforcement, gun safety, and all the rules which are already existing. You know, so mm -hmm. what additional thing they are expecting from the Board of Health? So um, that's what the th Two things I think if we can clarify, I think we can we can start deliberating on that. Where where it was going when I was on the board and then I started looking at the minutes after I left the board, but it was um, deferred and nev never picked up again, was um, contacting uh, pediatricians and uh, primary care providers if they asked in their um, uh, uh, annual visits, they ask if a child has a car seat, was in a seat belt, has a bike helmet, is there a gun in your house? Is it locked? Um, I'm sorry to chime in again. I might be able to help you all with this. Um, Crest receives a grant from the violence prevention folks over at DPH uh, who monitor these data points for every community in the Commonwealth. Um, mm -hmm. So we could ask them for uh, any pertinent information that they felt was worth sharing. Um, hopefully, we could we could broaden it and ask them for any sort of violence, so kind of uh, preventable uh, violence like car accidents to everything, and just get you all kind of a, a up to date report from them on on whatever whatever data they have available. I know they you know they have a team of about you know 40, 50 people working on it, so so it's pretty rich. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Do you have any other th anything else you want to add, Earl, while you're here on, on this topic? On this topic, and is this something that the Board of Health and Crest could explore together? I mean, we're certainly talking about it. the The reality is, um, in comparison to our to some of our neighboring communities, we certainly don't see guns in our community. The police are not. You know, kind of if, if you go down to Hamden County, you see some of those communities are, are kind of engaged in this sort of uh, um, finding guns on people in the community in fairly regular amounts. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, the larger piece we see is, is some fairly significant untreated mental health, um, mm -hmm. but the ability to, to readily and freely access a gun um, is, is pretty challenging. Um, the police have a, a really robust training course called Alice for uh, active shooter training. I think that might be interesting because that information has really shifted over the years. Um, if folks remember that kind of post Columbine world messaging was just to hide. Um, and now, after, as you're seeing some of the things that are happening around the country, the message now is really to to escape. Um, to get out of spaces as much as possible, which is a huge shift. And if you think of some mm -hmm. folks in town who haven't had that training in a significant amount of time, they may have some messaging, but um, the PD really likes doing those trainings too. And, and you know, they, they're, they, they get a lot of experience doing it. So 
Um, I, mean, I, I also think Scott, you know, with, with his amount of history here, can give you a narrative that goes much farther back than I and, and uh, you know, likes to talk about these things. You, you may want to ask him just to, some questions via email, and I'm sure he'd be glad to, to let you know if there are issues worth discussing. As a board member in 2015, I felt um, very good having Scott come and talk about it. Um, and, and explain what was happening with guns, how people were licensed. And I, I think we, we could benefit from it um, uh, because at that point we, we might say, well, the risk and protective factors here are, are okay and we really don't need to develop any prevention strategies. But I think um, because Gun violence affects the well-being and, and safety of all. And now every kid, like my grandchildren, every every kid is aware of what's happening. And I, I think as a board, we should educate ourselves because um, there's so many um, people killed by violence and then also non-fatal um, uh, firearm injuries, not to men mention domestic violence. And we had... Um, a mother killed by the, the father quite a few years ago. Um, they lived in Amherst, but the, the, the shooting took place outside of court in, in Northampton. Um, so I, I, I just feel that we sh should become a little more aware of, of what's happening because it is such a public health issue. And if you want to proceed with that, we could get Scott to come and talk about it. Or if you feel that we should defer it um, as it was in 2016, we can defer it. Comments? Maureen? Well, I was just thinking respecting the chief's time, it might be helpful to email and get some data and get some data through the, the Department of Public Health and then have another discussion about it and then bring Scott in for questions and follow up to that. You know, I just think okay. it might be like a place to get to, but it might be more informed if we had some information ahead of time. Okay. And, and also, uh, I think Earl mentioned the increase in mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, which looks like it's much more um, critical, especially when they have access to guns. You know, so uh, I think that statistics could also be included. You know, if if we can, you know. So, Jen, can you get us this information? Um, Nancy, it on you. yeah. Yeah. So be, I'm very interested in su supporting this. So Nancy, you and I can talk okay. um, and uh, you can, you know, guide me with what kind of questions Earl and I uh, collaborate frequently. We are in the same building and um, we can, we can dig into this. Okay. So I, I, I'll be home at the end of the month. So maybe we can, the three of us can sit down and yeah. uh, come back with something to tell the board in September then. Yeah, let me support you with this. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Ed, you're on vacation. Any other comments about gun violence or are you okay with that? We will, the three of us will look at it and get information back to you in September. Is that okay with the board? Yeah. Sounds good with me. Okay. So, Ed, Geothermal wells popping up in town. You're on. Sorry, was that my cue? I was just yeah, that's you. Question. We have one, two, three, four of them on our agenda here. So All you're right. busy with geothermal. Uh, we are, um, and we have uh, in an attendee, um, Hannah Kowalski, who is the uh, permit coordinator, I believe, for Dandelion Energy. All four of the current geothermal applications are from her company. There are two in the downtown area, and then the other two are out 
on Linden Ridge Road, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a fairly new street still building out on the Belchertown side off of Route 9. Mm -hmm. um, I um, believe you've received all the materials. The applications were thorough and complete. I did visit each of the properties um, and I didn't note for any of them any particular difficulties. Um, they were well cited, um, clearly marked, um, and I didn't find any issues with them. Um, because we have uh, Hannah Kowalski in the audience, if you know, I would um, be happy to you know, here, actually, if you have questions to let her respond to. Can she tell yes. us about these projects? I'd be Hi. Um, to learn. <laughs> yes, of course, sorry, my laptop camera does not want to connect right now, but I can um, share my screen and show you some diagrams and some site plans of what we are planning on doing, if that's okay. okay yeah, I'm interested, especially downtown. Perfect. Because the properties are close there. Let me see if I can get the screen sharing to work. Uh, Jennifer, I'm having some issues. It's saying that it's um, I'm not able to share my screen. Would it be better if I email some diagrams over to someone who can? Um, or? I'm going to see if I can make you co-host, Hannah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jennifer. Uh, no, no, it's just you know, I'm on the learning curve here. See, see if that's given you more access. Perfect, that's exactly what I need. Okay. Okay, so uh, for starters, this is just a general geothermal overview. Um, so what we are doing is uh, in the yard, we'll be drilling these ground loops. You can kind of see what they look like over here. It's obviously very oversimplified. Um, it's a closed tube that has a, uh, it's a mixture of glycol and water. It's food safe. It's basically what you would find in your refrigerator. Um, and it cycles from the heat pump in your home into the ground where it has a heat exchange with the, you know, the earth there and then comes back up into your home. So in the uh, summer, it takes the heat from your house puts it, you know, does a heat transfer between the air in your house and the fluid in the tube, goes down into the earth, um, the heat dissipates into the ground and then brings back up liquid that's around 55 degrees um, and then does a heat exchange again. So it air conditions your house. Um, in the winter, we do the same thing, but in reverse. So we take the heat from the ground, which again, it's around 55. We bring it up back into your home um, there's an air compressor in the uh, geothermal furnace, which increases the temperature from 55 to around 120, which is basically the standard for forced air heat. Um, and then we disperse that through your home. So this way you can heat and cool your house without having to use any sort of fossil fuels. Um, the downsides to this are, uh, you know, obviously you need to have a ground loop in your yard. So you need to have yard available where we could drill. Um, and also it, it is drilling. So I know some towns in uh, Massachusetts are a little bit wary about drilling. This isn't fracking and this is a closed loop. So once the loops are in the ground, we grout the whole thing up. Um, so there should be no fluid exchange between our loops and the groundwater and no fluid exchange between our loops and like the domestic water lines in the home. Um, does anyone have any questions about this so far? No. Great. Well, um, like, so if, um, and so it doesn't affect, um, especially out in, um, I'm not sure where all our aquifers are in Linden Ridge. We, do we have aquifers out there? Does it affect our aquifers? It should not. So we have our own um, drill rigs. Let me pull up the next set of images here. Um, and so you can see what the drilling process looks like. Okay, here we go. Let me know if you can see the next page. This would be your, just some general images of a different job that we've already done. 
So here you can see the drill rig itself. What we do is as we drill, we put down metal casing, um, which keeps all of our material inside, uh, basically the metal casing. So we're inject or we're, um, excuse me, we're using basically a, a sonic drill rig, which is just a very high vibrating metal tube. We push that metal tube down. The metal tube itself is sealed. Once we get down to depth, all of the material inside of the tube, all the soil, you know, rock, uh, dirt, clay, et cetera, um, gets pulled out of the ground. So what you see here is the, um, this is the material from inside of the drill rig, inside of the, um, the probe, as it were. Uh, we let that sit, we let that dry out, and then we put our loops in and we grout. And as we grout, we pull the metal tube out. So there shouldn't be any exchange at any point between the aquifer and what we're doing. Um, here's some other photos. So this is another silt fence kind of example. This is the material that we pulled out of the ground. It's fenced in with silt, so it doesn't go all over uh -huh. the yard. It doesn't go in the street. This picture right here is an example of the loops themselves. So you can see the black here is the, the plastic tubing. They're coming out from the grouted well, going across the yard into the basement. And then when it's done, we return the front yard to the original grade. So we just backfill the material that we pulled out, unless it's you know contaminated or if it's particularly cobbly, then we'll get new clean fill and replace what we excavate with the clean material. Okay. I, Thank I you. Had a few and um, Lauren has a question. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. I had posed I this had to the board before. Sorry, the echo. No worries. Um, let me see if I can. Um, do it. Okay. Um, one of my questions was how many geothermal wells like would not be um, a problem for the town and the groundwater? And I still hear an echo, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Sure thing. So um, what your town would want, obviously, it depends on, on what you decide in this meeting and going forward. Um, I have the uh, all the jobs that we are hoping to drill open, so I can just show you real quick. This is for uh, 77 McLean Street. So for that home, in this example, we would only need two wells. Um, and it's, it's, you know, obviously home specific. The number of wells we drill has to do with how much heating or cooling the home needs. Um, so if it's a larger house, it will need more wells, but on average we can get between one and three for, you know, your, your typical residence. Um, let me grab the next one here. This is for 96 Linden Ridge. This one has three bores in the backyard, you can see here. I apologize if you can hear my dog, she's unhappy. This is the next one. This is 111 Linden. This is two bores here. And then this is the last one we have. I believe this is 10 Pleasant. And this is also going to be two bores as well. Um, what what is the benefit of the geothermal wells to the homeowners? Is it more efficient or what is? 
so the biggest benefit is um, not having to pay for the oil or gas to heat and cool your home. So um, personally, I live in Connecticut, so I have a better idea of the cost of heating and cooling in the state of Connecticut. But um, this past winter for us, it was around $5 a gallon for heating fuel. Um, so with the geothermal system, you have obviously the, the green energy effect, which is, you know, you're not burning any carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide creating materials to heat and cool your home, but also you don't have to pay that um, monthly bill to the heating and cooling companies, to the oil and gas companies. Um, so it does use electricity to run the pump, both the pump for the fluid exchange and also the uh, pump or fan for the house. But beyond that um, increase in electricity, all of the heating and cooling would be you know, provided by the earth under your home. So it's a way of getting off of oil and gas and having a smaller bill. Um, obviously, you know, you do have to pay for the installation of the home or of the, um, the wells and the furnace, but uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut and New York are also, the states are providing incentives to lower that cost for the homeowner. Um, and if you are getting, if you're replacing your heater or your furnace or boiler, um, often getting a geothermal system can be cost effective. Um, if you're going to be replacing your old equipment anyway, this can be a comparable way of getting yourself a new furnace, but also lowering your monthly fees in the winter or summer. So how deep are the wells? Are they, um, are they... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ted. No, I'm just checking, you know, uh, do the depth of the wells vary with the demand of the energy? Yeah, we try and keep, so each well, um, we try and not go deeper than 400 feet. Usually they're around 300. It depends on the geology of the area. Um, if you have, you know, shallow bedrock, for example, you can get very deep without issue. Um, but usually we have a general assessment of what we think is in the ground based off of, you know, the quadrants that um, we have, you know, the geology uh, quadrants. But when we actually get out there, it can obviously be different. There can be cracks or other, um, you know, bedding shifts that are not anticipated. So we try and get to 300 feet with each of these bores. Um, if we run into problems in the field, sometimes we have to revise our plan. But if that's the case, we'll have to, you know, submit something to you guys or submit something to the uh, building department just to let you know what we've seen and why we need to change from our original plan. And how is the maintenance over the long run? I'm just uh, uh, quickly say, uh, say, for example, maintenance, we installed it with minimal impact mm -hmm. on the groundwater systems or aquifer. Down the road, there was, a, you know, some sort of a leak or and then you have to dig in and then <laughs> fix it. And I'm just curious, what is the history of um, that type of a, uh, repair costs and what mm -hmm. type of, how, what will be the environmental impacts of that? Yeah, I, I can get our actual engineer to give you um, a better, you know, more specific uh, guidelines, but we believe based on the quality of the materials that we use that the wells themselves shouldn't need repair for a hundred years. The furnace in your home, the actual equipment, um, I believe has a 20 year warranty. So after 20 years, you may need to replace the actual, you know, physical heat exchanger, but the loops themselves should be good for around a hundred years without any issue. Uh, this question was primarily intended if there are many installations like this coming up in the town. Um, and if it is 100 years, that's <laughs> that's a very ideal one. That means uh, I, I'm sure the materials are some sort of very robust to any shifts and stuff like that. But uh, um, is, I, I think is any type of impacts are essentially going to be on the surface water, mostly on the construction stage, where there's a lot of site preparation and everything. And it's very similar to any type of a 
development construction. So, I am sure that I think a lot of mitigation is being done during the construction stage, right? Yes, but um, obviously like one if we are going to encounter issues, usually it will be during drilling just because like I said, the biggest unknown for us is what the geology actually looks like in the ground. Um, and we do have, you know, some towns uh, have, I, I don't want to say more strict, but you know, they're more particular about the guidelines for what uh, our site looks like during drilling. We have a couple towns in New York, for example, that want um, a silt fencing inspection before we start work, just to make sure that everything, you know, is packaged away nicely before we start work. Um, in Connecticut, we almost always do a trench inspection. So once the wells are drilled, the trench is dug, but before we backfilled everything, just so that the town can see what we have on site and what it looks like. Um, so we're more than happy to, to do anything like that if that would uh, help, you know, just sometimes it's just nice to see it in process. Mm -hmm. um, but as for, you know, obviously there could be issues if there's like an earthquake or something that would, you know, shorten or be concerning for that hundred year life uh, lifespan. But we do use the um, glycol we use is food safe. And I'm happy to provide an MSDS for that if that would be of interest to you guys. So even if it does leak, it shouldn't put toxins into the aquifer itself. Yeah, that's a safe one. Um, is DEP, mass DEP involved in the, in the during the site construction? They, we've reached out to them and they no longer care about closed loop systems. Um, I have an email that I can forward you guys as well. And um, I can give you the name of the uh, fellow I spoke with. Um, they still are concerned about open loop things that have active um, flow between, you know, your heating system and the groundwater, but they don't consider uh, closed loop systems fracking or um, something that they particularly are concerned with at this time. Um, I just have uh, one other question. Uh, because we're a board, because we're a board of health, um, I don't know what the regulations are around this. Like, how, how many geothermal wells are we supposed to approve or? You know, I just, you know, from from just, you know, learning a, a little bit about it, I just, that's one of my questions, like, and how does it, how do all these um, wells affect the general water level if there's, like, not a limit to how many wells are being built? Thank you. Um, well, they shouldn't affect like the water that's being, you know, used in the aquifer because they're going to be closed off from the aquifer. Um, you know, obviously, in theory, it shouldn't change anything at all. Um, because we're grouting as we go, there shouldn't be any water, you know, coming up from our holes or any water going down through our holes. Um, we've, and, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm biased because I work for this company, but we've done a lot of these wells in New York and Connecticut. Um, and we haven't had any issues, you know, with aquifers or with the towns that we've been working with. Um, obviously, stuff happens. The I think the worst that we've had so far was we had a, um, oh gosh, what's it called? Uh, basically, we we drilled through a a, a, a confining layer um, and had water coming up through our hole from the groundwater, um, and that was more just a concern because it made the site a mess, it had water, we had, you know, excess water on the site. But in terms of like, once we grouted that well up, um, that water went back to having a confining layer. So it wasn't a constant flow of water from the aquifer out. Um, and the name of that system is gonna, gonna bug me all night. Um, but beyond that, we haven't had any issues with like things leaking out of the aquifer or things, um, you know, going into the aquifer. And again, I'm biased because I work for this company, but we've been doing this for five years and we have not had any issues with that so far. Um, and sorry, while I was, while you were talking, Lauren, I pulled up the uh, email from the DEP. So it's up on the screen now, if you want to take a look, I will also forward this along.
Any other questions for Hannah? Um, Hannah, um, you mentioned about fracking um, similarity. I think fracking, let's say open system where you, we have to pump and a lot of potential impacts on methane emissions and these are underground emissions, you know. So, uh, so this system will not have these types of impacts. Yeah, we haven't seen that because it's just a single, you know, one or two boreholes as opposed to with fracking, it's multiple boreholes. Um, usually you have a, uh, you know, a receiving end where you would pull the material up that you were pushing out and then um, uh, basically an input end. So with fracking, you have two ends of borehole fields and then you force fluid through, you know, one end of the bores which causes the natural gas and, and other fluids to flow out to your receiving boreholes. Um, the big concern with that is just, uh, first of all, you know, you're, you're doing fields of boreholes, um, both on the receiving end and the input end. Um, and also you're displacing material that's in the ground. So, you know, natural gas and other things with whatever uh, in fracking, it's usually like a proprietary fluid. Um, the concern with that is that if the density and the pressure is not the same of the of the fluid you're injecting as what you're pulling out, you can end up with fissures and fractures in the bedrock, um, and you know bedrock collapse because this is just a single like straw hole down that we then grout up. You don't have the same extent or concern. Um, it's these are very similar to groundwater wells. It's just instead of you know punching down a straw that then slurps up water from the aquifer. It's just a punched hole that gets filled in and just sits there. It's like a more like a cork than a straw. Other questions? Thank you, Hannah. Anytime. And I will, um, like I said, I can send this along, along with um, any other uh, photos or diagrams that you guys would like, just let me know what the best email for that would be. Um, Jen, Jen Brown's email, and then she can get it out to us. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I just have one thing. I noticed this little discrepancies. I think it's more of a clerical kind of thing than a, um, a big issue, but the Linden Kramer, uh, Linden, the 111 Linden, it says the site plan has three boreholes. The letter of support says there are two. And mm. um, then on the 196 Linden, there are two boreholes on the site plan and two in the letter, but the photo that's attached to the letter shows three, three marked boreholes. So I think they just need to, you know, align um, in terms of being, you know. That, that may have been something that I did, Maureen. It um, might have, and, and that's, I, I could see with four of them going on at once that that is something I could actually have done. But um, I just just think that they we need to pay attention to that, making sure we're approving what what is actually out there. Yep, well the material, what I would say is the material that Hannah submitted is appears to be correct. It may be that my um, letter was was in error. Right. I don't have everything in front of me. But, I know. Um, the one on 96, though, actually showed three marked things in the lawn. So that, that was what okay. um, <laughs> confused me. And two marked two on the site plan. Yep. I, I just got really interested in this because I actually have a geothermal system for my house, but it's a, a horizontal loop. It's like a, the slinky type. Um, it's about 10 years old and I'm really happy about it. Um, and I think it helps reduce, you know, it use it, it's more efficient than other systems. So it reduces all total carbon, regardless of where the electricity and you know, what's being used to generate the electricity. Um, whether that's propane or whatever else is out there. Okay, so Ed. Yes. 
you want us to approve these or are you just yes please okay so I yeah, need, uh, what one thing I would would just say is that these projects involve other permits from the, the um, Department of Inspections, um, any applicable electrical or uh, plumbing or mm -hmm. um, actual building department, you know, overall building permits. So there is a um, uh, another layer of supervision that's going on for the whole system, but the well regulations in Amherst do require the Board of Health to approve all wells. Mm -hmm. Ed, um, uh, do you have the layout with aquifers mapped on it? I, I don't have that, but I could get that. Um, Aaron Jacques and I had talked about working on some maps and I'd be happy to, to if that already exists, that probably does to share it with the board. Um, yeah, Cause that was one of our early concerns. Will these, geothermal wells affect any of our aquifers. Yeah, I believe that these are all not in, in anywhere near any of our wells or the, you know, the aqua, aqua surface water that the town uses. Um, but, but that map is something we could would all find useful. It'll be, I mean, this four, may not be affecting but i think as we move into more and more applications coming in mm -hmm. um, with each installation having three or four wells which are 300 feet or something like that you'll start to see some sort of a some physical Im impact on the aquifers you know so that's what i i mean down the road there might be something we need to consider Thank you, Tim. Well, is it the board's pleasure to approve these four wells? And if so, I need a motion. I make a motion to approve those four wells. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. And for the record, it's 77 McClellan Street, 96 Linden Ridge. 111 Linden Ridge and 10 Pleasant Court. So it's been moved and seconded and now we will vote. Um, Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? I'm gonna abstain. Okay, and Nancy, aye. Okay, so we have three ayes and one abstention. Thank you. So now, and it's, thank you, Ed. Oh, and enjoy the rest you. of your vacation. <laughs> thank you. And thanks especially to Hannah Kowalski for yeah, thank um, you. bringing yeah. her expertise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. glad that I could come. I'm sorry thank I you. couldn't yeah, get my It was very informative. Thank you. Anytime. Okay, okay right. now we have Ed, uh, Earl Miller to give us Introduce himself to us and talk about Chris. Hi, I'm I'm on a string of bad luck. Oops, Yesterday, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. do you have your hand up, Lauren, for anything? No. Okay. Okay. I was saying, okay. I'm on, yeah, no worries. I was the saying I'm on a string yours. of bad luck. <laughs> Yesterday, I did a legal women voters event, and I had to follow a rocket scientist. And today, <laughs> I. I turned my camera off because I I'm, I felt like I was making little kid faces trying to, I didn't know that was a thing that was possible. So you learn something new every day. Um, I'm the director of our community responders for equity, safety and service department. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people use the word program, but it, one of the really distinct features of, of what we're doing is that we are at the third leg of public safety in Amherst as of July 5th. So. Um, we have eight community responders who will be working in pairs of two. Uh, I have a program assistant, Kat Newman. Some of you may know her from the ambassador <laughs> program, uh, which she, she led for a, a long period of time. Um, and we are, uh, it's, it, there's, there's a very long version of it. I'd say the short version is where we're looking at, um, you know, challenges that um, communities that may often find themselves without uh, a clear-cut public safety entity to engage with um, might have. 
Um, those often look like things like homelessness, uh, mental health challenges. For some folks, just a real fear of, um, of public safety, of police. Um, and we recognize that that is uh, most common in communities of color for, for lots of really uh, valid reasons. And, um, you know, I think we're one of, uh, Amherst is one of probably about 100 communities that started to have this conversation. Uh, and only a few of those com communities got to, uh, to bear fruit from those conversations. Um, so we, you know, we're, our approach is we, we are unarmed. Um, we're, we're centering our work around de-escalation, uh, motivational interviewing. Uh, if folks haven't heard of that modality, it's a mental health modality of uh, curiosity and relationship building. Um, the idea being that the relationship is where the healing happens and cultivating that um, and asking questions that allow for that are really important. Our responders uh, are multiracial. Uh, we have folks from uh, we have folks who speak Swahili. We have a, a Spanish speaker on our team. We have the former student life director from uh, Western New England University. Uh, we have a really diverse team as far as experience uh, and life experience. So um, I've been on the job since March 21st. Uh, I've been trying to get as much work as I could as a, a kind of team of one. Um, and really, uh, I think to, to Timothy, your point earlier, um, one of the real challenges is coming out of the pandemic. There are a lot of people who didn't have mental health challenges before that, who are now um, having these, and it's challenging because it doesn't look so similar for everyone. For some people, it's a pretty profound depression um, from those kind of months of quarantining, um, of not having social contacts. And, and right, uh, for those of us where it comes easy, uh, socializing doesn't necessarily feel that hard, but for folks where it is a little bit more of an effort, um, that can feel really, really stunted. For some folks, uh, you know, it, it looks like some, you know, symptoms that might be, you know, hearing voices, suicidality, uh, lots of things are coming back. Folks are mistrustful of the government. Um, that seems to be a, a pretty pervasive feeling these days from kind of all sides of the, the conversation, uh, people feeling less steady with things. So um, we, we're training currently at the Munson Library. Uh, feel free to pop it and say hi. Um, and we'll be training until uh, the last week of August or first week of September. Uh, we're, we're, we're saving that last week just in case we feel like we need a little bit of finishing before we go. Um, and kind of the way I describe our work is really three parts right now. Uh, we will take 911 calls. Uh, we will be first responders in some settings. Uh, we had a report done by a group called LEAP that suggested that about 20% of the calls, uh, 911 calls uh, year to year um, fit really neatly for us. Um, they're calls that maybe wouldn't have even generated a response before we started. Um, assisting, so you know, one of the scenarios I think about this, and this is domestic violence, which is, is obviously a public health concern. Um, you know, really the way we deal with domestic violence now is to remove the perpetrator, but that often ignores the fact that you then leave the rest of the folks there who have, who have had a member of their family leave, who've been the victims of abuse, who are now having to move forward without much support. So um, when 911 calls come for that and uh, the criminal justice aspect of it has ended, providing support for folks on the other side of that. Um, and then I think what is most important to me is prevention. Uh, hopefully uh, as much as we can, keeping folks from ever needing to call 911 by addressing their concerns uh, as upstream as we can be. Um, you know, my sense of all these things is, you know, waiting until things have broken down is often too late. Um, people have already lost a lot. So um, to that end, you'll see us uh, throughout town. Uh, we've done engagement events at uh, some of the apartment complex. We had a really about 150 people at Groff Park. It was uh, about 100 degrees that day. So I was surprised anybody showed up. But um, <laughs> There's a lot of excitement and, and I'm excited and, you know, we, we feel there's a lot of pressure. We, we already have other municipalities reaching out to us um, to, to hopefully join us in this experiment. And, and it is an experiment. Um, the unique features, there is nothing quite like Amherst. Um, it is nothing <laughs> quite like Amherst. Um, but there is no uh, attempt like this in a town this small. Um, most of these are in, in municipalities that are at least 100,000 people. Um, places like Denver, Seattle, Portland, Camden, uh, Durham, North Carolina. So we are one of the smaller municipalities, which most towns are about our size. Um, so if we can do it, that really does open it up for a lot of other folks. Um, 
and we're a public safety department. Northampton is doing a similar attempt, but it's a public health approach. Um, not that public health isn't deeply important to me, but um, I just have learned that it's sometimes easier to be in public safety and work with public health as opposed to the alternative. Um, and Jennifer is such a great partner that even if we're not, you know, nestled under public health, uh, I think we're going to give you guys a lot of bang for your buck too. And um, I come from the Department of Mental Health, so you know, prevention is really—it's just something I feel really strongly about. So I don't know. That's my spiel. Uh, if it made sense, it didn't. I certainly should not have followed uh, heating your house with the ground, uh, which is a thing I didn't know about. So. <laughs> So any questions or anything, glad to, to talk about it. Does anyone have a question for Earl? Uh, I have a quick question. Is Lauren? Uh, oh, 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 go I, ahead, Lauren. <laughs> go ahead, Tim, go ahead. Oh, I, I had a question about prevention. I think you, you had this, you mentioned prevention. Uh, that's a very, you know, it, it might consume a lot of your time uh, assessing, you know, looking at some of the data and evidence. And I'm just curious, um, uh, what type of prevention you do in, in, in coordination with pediatricians or primary care providers who have some sort of and psychiatrists and everything. I'm just curious. Actually, me and Jennifer are working on an initiative to bring some psychiatry to bear in town. Um, you know, one of the one of the state initiatives that has really worked is this line that pediatricians can call to get kind of direct consultations from a psychiatrist. But as it has grown, uh, there is a lack of psychiatry everywhere, um, everywhere you go. Um, and so sometimes that line takes a long time to get back to folks. And so the idea of bringing some psychiatry into town, um, doing some consultations for folks, um, having a sense of the resources in the community and what they actually look like, right? If you call a mental health clinic, they're going to tell you we take people. You know, I'll be honest, the majority of the ones really close to us have fairly long wait lists, um, particularly the kind of large ones. So who has openings um, and how long is the wait and what can we do to keep sustain people through those waits? Um, the other piece is bringing to bear some of the programs in the area that are not very well known. Um, I think of PrEP. Um, psychosis recovery, uh, prevention and recovery in early psychosis, which is a program for people who are having their first um, experiences of hearing or seeing things that other folks are not. Um, one of the things we know is that if you can get treatment for folks in the first, you know, two or three years of that experience, the outcomes are generally much better than if you wait until when most people get treatment, which is somewhere between eight to 10 years later when folks feel like they can come out with those experiences. Um, the other piece is the responders will we'll have some limited case management ability, really targeted to get people from a distressing event, a life interrupting challenge to uh, resources. Um, particularly what I see in Amherst is a lot of people who are waiting for openings in clinics, who are waiting for psychiatry appointments, and there's nobody is supporting them in those moments uh, unless they end up in real trouble. Um, the, the other piece is there's a, there's a reality to to what it's like to have particularly mental health conditions um, that the system kind of uh, puts people in positions where the only time you get resources or, or support is when you are in the worst moment of your life. And when things get better, all those resources instantly kind of dry up. Um, so sustaining people through their kind of early recovery until they feel a little bit more steady on their feet. Um, it, initiatives we'll use are things like the Columbia Scale for Suicide Prevention. Uh, Columbia Scale is a really kind of in the field assessment that is uh, flexibly built to not, for some people they feel kind of chronically suicidal. And one of the, the faults of suicide scales is that they catch those people and they often end up going to hospital, to the hospital for experiences that they've learned to sustain themselves through. Uh, Columbia Scale doesn't just rank the in the moment experience, it ranks the historical risk Right, suicide is much more likely for folks uh, having their first attempt than someone who's a little bit further down the line uh, for a variety of reasons. I can talk prevention forever uh, and I, I really like to do that. Um, we're taking good notes as we're going through our training. So by the end of it, we'll have a real uh, list of, of approaches we're using and connections we're making like at the schools um, with the social workers at the schools who are supporting kids, the restorative justice program. Um, you know, we wanna be as, as deeply embedded in the town as the other public safety entities. Thank you for asking that. 
Lauren, I had, uh, the, yes. okay, can go, you Lauren. hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, have you received any phone calls yet? <laughs> any phone calls? Have people, yes. Have people been able to actually call Crest? Or how, how I, I probably have asked this before, but how do people actually get to be, you know, helped or supported by the press? That's a great question. So we're not live now. We're in we're in training. So I just want to be super clear because I, I know folks have waited two years for this. People are ready for it to go. Um, what what would be um, most dangerous is having untrained folks um, making approaches without a real sense of that. Um, so we started training on July 5th. Our training ends the end of August, September. We're going to do some events to promote the number. There will be a line directly to Crest. All of the responders will have their own lines, so they'll be able to take calls individually um, and like every other public safety entity folks will be able to call in through the regular 911 dispatch line um, a question i'll have a good answer for you in like january february is how 988 the new the new kind of federal initiative will impact us uh, it just went live on the 12th so none of us are quite sure what it's going to look like yet but earl i have to amend that you have helped us already with some case consultations so thank you for that and, and that, you know that's one of the great things about Amherst is folks are willing to let us be supportive. You know, there's a lot of places where people get really territorial over the work, and I appreciate the spirit, particularly from the public health folks, about you know when folks come to the building and are struggling, being willing to engage the folks around us, and being in that same building with them in the senior center is such a, a force multiplier for all of us. And that's such a big part of public health is, you know, people call us, we really want to make sure that we can link them with different services. And I know that's something that you and I have talked about is we used to have something, and I know I say this frequently, called Amherst Human Service Network. And it was a great, great program that Julie Fetterman put in. And you and I are going to talk about that and rename it and breathe some, some fresh air, some new life into that. That's really important. Having uh, regional collaborative processes is super important. Right now, a lot of providers are kind of working in the dark. And for some folks, that means they're getting duplicative care. Um, you know, two people are trying to work on the same issue while other challenges are unaddressed. And um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to kind of roll in the same direction with public health. Thank you. We appreciate it. So once we get going and I have a sense of what things are looking like, I will send Jennifer some information for you all. I always want to be a good partner to public health. So if you ever have questions about what we're doing, um, you ever want to participate in any of our activities or just see what we're doing, maybe have a responder come, someone who's doing the work and talk to you about that. Um, you, you all are very important to me. Um, and, and because we don't have that sort of contractual obligation to each other that Northampton does, it'll be really important that, you know, if you guys have a question, my door is always open for you. Uh, and I hope vice versa. You know, we were just talking today about what happens if COVID happens. We're a very small team. And um, I caught COVID while I was in Amherst and Jennifer and her team gave me really good advice. I took antivirals. I felt better very quickly. Um, so, so they've already been really helpful to me. It was, uh, I've caught COVID three times. So uh, I seem to be a real, you might want to avoid me, um, but I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Earl. I'll see you all soon, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, lots thanks. of luck with nice all the training. Thank you. It's very exciting. Okay, so director's updates. Well, I have to say, I think that's a hard act to follow. He was saying it's a hard act to follow. So excited about, about collaborating with him and having him in the bank center up on the second floor. So um, I'm gonna start with the COVID update. Um, our numbers are lower, but they're still coming in. For example, we have 66 people in isolation now, seven new people um, overnight, but we know that this is a gross undercount. And we've been saying that for a while. Um, people are using antigen tests, they're not reporting. And it's at the point where the Department of Public Health as of this week is changing their reporting to weekly reporting. So collecting the data daily, but reporting it weekly. Um, here in Amherst, our dashboard will continue to um, uh, go on in the same manner. We'll post daily, at least for the fall semester. 
Um, the BA.5 or BA.5, I've heard yeah. it, or BA.5, what's that, dot, dot five? Dot five, yeah, I've been reading yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 65% of the total cases. I see some notes from two, two Board of Health meetings ago, it was at 7%. 65% total cases spreads easily, evades immunity um, from vaccine and prior infections. So here we are, it's, I don't wanna say it's a lull, um, but it's a quiet time, but we sure are watching our numbers, um, our other indicators, hospitalizations, um, people being sick for this fall. And we're really gonna be monitoring this very closely. Um, we are in a different place than we were last year. Really, we know what our tools are and what we're gonna be able to do to, to, to leverage those. You know, We have vaccination, testing, stay home if you're sick is a big one, um, ventilation masks, and like Earl was saying, um, Paxlovid or the antivirals. So I'm just throwing that out, that's what we have. Um, I do want to make another plug for our wastewater reports. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Amherst um, Department of Public Works. Um, they are taking samples three to four times a week. Those get sent off to Jamaica Plain. Biobot analyzes them and they go come back to us and thank you IT for posting them. We have a really great website. Those um, numbers, um, I was gonna say the numbers don't translate into actual cases. Don't try to guess or estimate, but really we're looking at trends and those trends happen um, prior to people um, reporting cases um, or if there's asymptomatic. The Department of Public Health is also going to start posting wastewater um, biobot reports as of this week. They get posted Thursday at 5 p.m., so those should be up. Um, but that's something that we really have as a tool. Um, it's not the one key public, you know, key indicator we'll look at, but it's it's one of the things that we'll continue to look at. Um, that's the COVID update. I'm going to go into some other things. Um, we continue to have free antigen tests here that I help come to the Amherst Health Department. We have about 1,200. Um, we'll give them to you. We will distribute them again. This is our third shipment um, with our partners. I think we're, we're sort of we're not sitting on them, come get them if you need them. We've been giving them to Amherst Survival Center, Craig's Doors, um, other, other areas that would benefit from them. Come fall, I think we're really gonna try to do more of a push and get those into people's hands. And I always make a plug for antigen tests. They're a great public health tool. If you're asking the question, am I infectious? It's gonna give you a really good answer. So that's, that's how we use it to stop any kind of chain of transmission. The other thing is come get them before an event, before your senior vulnerable person um, and do cadence testing. Two days out, test yourself if it's negative. That day of, test yourself. Um, if it's negative, you have pretty high certainty with other things that you can enjoy um, other people's company with a mask if needed. Um, the UMass website is the Public Health Center is saying that the PCR testing is ending July 29th. So that's what DP, um, UMass is reporting on their website. So that PCR testing may be um, sunsetting. Oh. Um, here in the health department, our vaccine clinics, we were doing... Um, uh, I think we've done about 18,000 shots, not including home visits. But over the past two months, we've really seen a drop. So we're, we're hovering around 20 um, uh, 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 patients coming in over the past three weeks. What we're doing is we're ending the clinics, but we're morphing into office hours. So every Thursday from 12 to two, we'll be here to vaccinate if it's five people, if it's 30 people, but we're just shifting to sort of a, a, a different system. And with that, I say that we're gonna continue to monitor where we are. If we have a surge in the fall, we'll expand, we'll ramp back up. If there's a new bivalent vaccine and people want that, we'll be able to, to start vaccinating um, 
more people as needed. So we're ready to go with other direction. Um, <clears throat> um, I wanna announce, and some people know that we have a new public health nurse. She started last week. Um, Olivia Peters, we're so happy to have her here. Um, she's been a public health nurse um, in uh, Worcester, and she has, we stole her from the Department of Public Health and the tuberculosis program. She's been um, resettling new immigrants. Um, she's, she's bright, she's kind, she's multilingual, um, and I look forward to, to working with her. Um, you know, showing her what we do here and really learning from her and her expertise that she brings. So, so thank you, Olivia. I'm going to shift gears just very quickly um, at the Department of Public Health um, webinar that we used to have twice a week, then it was once a week, now it's once every other week. They mentioned very briefly about drought conditions. So I want to bring that to everyone's attention. If you Google drought DPH, it's a new web page to me. You can see where we are in um, uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, three days ago, I looked and we were a level one of four and yesterday we're level two of four. So I tell that to you with no more information that I can share, but it's something that we all need to be um, thinking about. Will we have water restrictions? Will the town use that data for water restrictions? So that's what I'm, I'm saying that I, I don't understand completely. So this is one source of information. So with this, I'm gonna to go to other departments and see what information they're getting. I, I'm sure it comes directly to, to other people and not just a, a mention at a you know, Department of Public Health webinar. But Thank I think, that, yeah, that should be everyone's um, on everyone's radar and something that I'll look into more. And then the last thing is that mosquito um, trapping started mid-June and we have in Massachusetts, the first West Nile virus mosquito in Essex, so north of Boston. Um, so that ramps up or hopefully does not ramp up um, over the, the summer. So we'll continue to report that and watch that and push out more information about preventative measures. That is my update. Thank you. Any questions for Jen from anyone? I'm so glad you finally have a nurse to help you. And well, thank you for covering both bases for all this time. It's greatly appreciated. It was well, a lot of work and most appreciated. You know, thank you. It was an honor. You're welcome. And I, I'm just thrilled. I'm thrilled to have her here for the residents. And I'm thrilled. I feel like it's going to open up more possibilities for me to support you and to do other interventions. Great. I have no um, topics that have been anticipated. Um, we have said that there's other public comment. So I don't know if anyone, I don't see any. There's just one phone number up. Yeah, no, I don't see any of their hands. Okay. <laughs> and we will, in the past, there has not been an uh, uh, August board meeting um, many years ago, <laughs> but once COVID, we had many meetings in August the past couple of years. So our next meeting is September 8th. Uh, are there any other comments before I ask for adjournment? Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, uh, this is a totally different area, but I think uh, since it's summer, some days are very hot. I'm just cu curious uh, if there is any tracking of like a heat effects on communities, you know, especially those who are having no public amenities, you know, like to cool off or air conditioning and everything. I'm just curious if we are seeing any cases like that or or, or do we have any statistics? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Jen, we talked about uh, cooling um, uh, places at our last meeting. So Jen, do you want to fill Tim in on all of that? 
Yeah, so what, what I can share about that is it, it's something that we are definitely talking about. And when I say we, um, it, the townwide, you know, I speak to other people, the um, fire department, um, they're in charge of cooling centers. Um, they've opened them when there's a certain heat index, you know, spread out over um, a period of days without, you know, relief at night. But there's this real acknowledgement that these hot days are going to be hotter and they're going to extend further, start earlier. So there's talk about, for example, what to do with these old buildings. And, and Maureen, you sort of grasped it well when we were talking about it. There's regulations in place that um, have allowed um, only certain cooling and heating days. So we're looking at um, a permanent variance to that. And I believe it, actually we have one written. So um, the Groff Park cooling pad, um, splash pad um, is something that they've opened early, and I think they're keeping it open uh, later at night. So it's it's something that's a, a real concern to us. I don't do not have statistics, but I know we had that those really hot weekend um, in May. Was it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was hot, and I can just see the sun on you know Clark Building here just beating down. It cooled down at night, and then two days later it was cool. But you know, there was a report out of Chicago that they had a similar heat wave. And I think a few people died, you know, so you can't just dismiss um, uh, these, these events. So. so when the fire department has cooling centers, I, I know with COVID it was complicated by not wanting to bring people into spaces. At, mm -hmm. um, are, what are the spaces that are currently targeted for something like that. I, and I know they had some outdoor cooling, like like tents and things like that and uh, water and fans, et cetera. But I, I don't know if that's something you know of or we'll wait to see what they have planned. Yeah, no, I mean, good question. I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. They've used the large activity room in the Bang Center mm -hmm. before. Um, and it's something that they'll, you know, determine. They're very aware, very on top of it. When we've had them in the past, we've had a pretty low turnout. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks opt to go to the library or some of the other smaller um, places mm -hmm. in town. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I just want to really assure people that it's on on people's minds how to 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 work with, you know, our homeless, um, as Nancy brought up last time during these heat spells, and, and what are we going to be doing? So. Tim, did that answer your question? Kind of. He wanted stats. <laughs> I, I don't have oh, you're you're Thank you. Um, I was just exploring, you know, if we have an inventory of places we announce or people can go to website and say these are the places where you can have access to this or that or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. I think so, so the town does a really good job of um, on the banner, you know, that'll go across and then through social media. So um, th that'll be posted. And th then also on the website itself, um, things get, um, you know, on the main web, web page, you go down, they, ha they have those um, big blocks with information. But I think that banner is a really good thing. Um, I also, I don't know what kind of, um, uh, alerts you can sign up for if that's an, an option maybe um or the reverse 911 is yeah. that used for that i mean it might not get to the populations you're trying to get to yeah. but um but it's another i guess it's another tool yeah. the other thing um if people have signed up for is that the enhanced 911 you're talking about Maureen that well I think if you sign up, up I don't know if you have to sign up for these but you know every once in a while you get an alert that yeah I, I there's even, a, like when there's a, a big power outage or there's a yeah. uh I can't even remember but right. I've gotten we've gotten some of yes. those calls yeah you're like, signed up for that but also I know um when our fa my father-in-law was living with us, we signed him up through the, um, the 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 call. Whoever you know, when you call in nine one one, that they knew we had an elder in our 
a vulnerable person in our house. So I, I don't know if people are signed up for that, if, if they can be alerted, because sometimes elders are not aware of what's happening to their bodies in extreme heat and they can dehydrate and die very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The Amherst Fire Department if on their webpage, I haven't put my eyes on it free, um, recently, but they had um, a place to sign up for alerts. Um, and it's something that I'm going to go in and make sure that I'm up to date with. But that used to be a place for tornado alerts or, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, harsh weather. Yeah. And, and just, I don't know if we're done with this, just this backtracking, I might have like spaced out, but we talked about the vaccine clinics, not clinics, the, but just having office hours for the 12 to 2 on Thursdays. So that's a change in the timing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and are, is there continued effort towards the youngest kids or is they, are they part of that whole mix too? Yeah. The, the new six to, relatively new six to six months to five year. Mm -hmm. You know, we had offered those two clinics um, morning for the little PDs. Thank yeah. you very much for being there yesterday and doing that. You know, we offered the two times and and that's what we were sort of thinking. What's what's it going to look like? Or is it a rush for people to get that vaccine and people's, you know, their kids immune system, you know, up and running, you know, um, two weeks after their their second. I think with our new public health nurse, I'm so looking forward to sort of more public or more outreach. So if there's a real need that, you know, we're going to continue these. Right. Um, if people are going to their pediatrician. Right. That's um, my sense is that, that might be a more natural thing at that age group to, to kind of to go towards your own pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I guess you'll see, right? If I think the demand. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I just remember Emma Dragon really saying every every one shot is really important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we do want to be efficient. Um, what's UMass doing? Kate Kelly Northampton does an incredible job. But we definitely want to support our community. There's, you know, we'll we'll, we'll always be vaccinating, always here. So where is there a need? It was very satisfying. Did you like vaccinating? Oh, it was, yes, it was really different. And, uh, you know, to see these, like mostly they were like between maybe two and four or something. And, and uh, it was different and it was very sweet. Yeah. And some families were very happy because now the whole family is vaccinated. So that it, was, um, you know, or is on the way to being vaccinated. I think it was momentous. Yeah, I'm so yeah. glad to be part of it. I didn't vaccinate, but you know, really we've been waiting for this since May, you know, so yeah. I'm happy for the parents. Yeah. And, um, oh, I, one other thing is I had talked to Jen about at our September meeting, having the new public health nurse just check in to be introduced to everybody. So oh, we'll, we'll do that you. after she's um, on board. I did forget that. Um, is there anything else? If not, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay. And I a second? Okay. Uh, all in favor of adjourning? Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy August. I hope we don't have to have any emergency meeting. Yeah, uh, could happen. <laughs> and, <laughs> no. and see you in September. All right. Thank you, Jen. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.